Hi everyone, Katie Anderson here, and I am so thrilled to be back with my good friend Mark Graben, this time to celebrate the release of his new book, The Mistakes That Make Us. Um, I've been a longtime friend of Mark for probably a decade and a half at this point. Mm -hmm. I've been on yeah. both of his podcasts quite uh, a few times, and uh, it, we've been collaborating on writing books, making mistakes and learning how to be better leaders and humans for a long time. Uh, so welcome, Mark. I'm happy to host you today. Yeah, thank you, Katie. I appreciate you doing this, and uh, it's great to be here. Yeah. Always good to talk to you. Well, I'm excited to be talking about your new book because you were so instrumental in helping me when I was working on my book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, and figuring out the whole process of writing, of publishing, um, of marketing and the ongoing uh, mistakes that you make when you are both writing and uh, releasing a book. So yeah. uh, I'm excited to dive into the concept of mistakes and uh, the celebration of your new book here today. Uh, so for people who don't know you, but I think that's highly unlikely, uh, mm -hmm. just give us a little bit about who you are and um, how you came to write a book about mistakes. Yeah. Well, thanks, Katie. Um, the long story short of it at this point, um, oh my gosh, it's been 28 years now since I graduated college. And, you know, I've always, my, I've always been focused on continuous improvement, almost always in the context of the Toyota production system or, or lean, you know, I started my career at GM um, in, in 1995, working with, um, you know, people who have been trained under Toyota. GM was trying to drag itself into um, the future uh, that way. And, you know, I, I, in different steps along the way, you know, my career was focused on manufacturing, or I thought. Um, I got the opportunity to do work in healthcare in 2005. And a lot of my work since then has been healthcare related. That's how then, you know, Katie and I met, you know, always, always trying to help people around really creating a culture of continuous improvement. Like a lot of that work is framed around lean. You know, I've written um, the book, uh, Lean Hospitals, a book co-authored with Joe Schwartz called Healthcare Kaizen, um, a, a book on my own called uh, Measures of Success about four and a half years ago. Um, and now this, this new book, The Mistakes That Make Us. But I really do love working with organizations that are trying to figure out how do we nurture this culture of continuous improvement. I think learning from mistakes is a big part of that. That's not the only thing that drives continuous improvement. But I think if you if you have a culture of learning from mistakes, you've got a fighting chance of having a culture of continuous improvement more broadly. Um, absolutely. And we we both have reflected that the learning from mistakes and the, you know, the the things that we don't that don't go so well are actually the accelerants to improvement. Mm -hmm. And so we have, it's a foundational, um, I guess, principle that we need in our organizations too. If we really want this culture of continuous improvement, we need the, yeah. the space to be able to make mistakes. Yeah. I'm, so I'm curious, you know, I've, you've had the lean blog for years and really have been a thought leader for a long time in the space of continuous improvement and quality and um, creating these cultures of, of learning and improvement. And, you know, your, your lean blog podcast, and we've been on, I can't, I don't even know how many times, maybe seven or we've, we've at had, least at least five. Yeah. Um, we've done some I, webinars. Yeah. And then I was excited, you know, when you were exploring, creating a new podcast, um, my favorite mistake. And mm -hmm. I imagine this is sort of the genesis of the book as well. So maybe yeah. uh, sort of how did that process of getting excited about creating a new podcast get started? And then a second question, how did that lead to the creation of the book, mm -hmm. Mistakes That Make Us? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, first off, going back to about 2015 or so, another book project that I didn't mention was a collaboration called Practicing Lean. Um, 15 other authors writing a chapter, kind of reflecting on early days in our own lean journey, a mistake we made then that we might not make now, sharing those and kind of trying to remind ourselves, including me, don't forget what that was like. You know, when 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 people are new to this, um, be kind, don't be too hard on people when they make a mistake, especially if they don't have the benefit of uh, a real good coach or any coach um, helping them. 
Um, so that had been in the back of my mind, you know, this idea of acknowledging, learning from mistakes and sharing mistakes. In 2020, summer of 2020, peak pandemic, wasn't traveling for work. Um, a lot of people wrote a book during pandemic. I guess I, I, I took on new podcast, um, not knowing at the time that was going to lead to a book. But you know, I had a PR person reach out kind of um, saying, hey, uh, Kevin Harrington, who was on the, the first season of the show Shark Tank, one of the sharks, had a new book um, about mentoring and he and his co-author were available for an interview. I thought that sounded great, but I couldn't figure out how to make it really a fit with the Lean podcast. And I thought, well, uh, you know, I've got time here. And I decided, like, maybe I, I got to find a way to say yes. So we kind of bounced some ideas back and forth, you know, it could be, could have been just a broader business podcast and um, Kevin Harrington and his co-author, Mark Tim, were actually on board with the idea of sharing a mistake. And so that led to my favorite mistake and they were both great. You know, it wasn't like the job interview of like, Katie, tell me about your, your greatest weakness. And, you know, you know the people if they don't really want to share a weakness, you're like, oh, well, that, that's not very interesting. If people didn't have like a legit mistake, like if, if people were to come on and say like, my mistake was working too hard and being too successful, yeah. you know, that there's not a lot of depth to that, or that might be a personal mistake, but, you know, people sharing business mistakes was something that actually took root. You know, I, I didn't know how many other, you know, they, they were great. I didn't know how many other guests would be willing uh, to do it. And I've just released episode 215. And, you know, two of those episodes um, have you involved, the first with Mr. Yoshino. And um, one of those early guests, so to answer your question about the book, one of my first 10 or first 20 guests, and my mistake is not remembering exactly who, and I've reached out to early guests and asked, like, do you remember mentioning after we stopped recording, asking me, this person asked me, are you doing this podcast because you're writing a book about mistakes? <laughs> and so that it planted a seed and it took maybe about you know, another year to really start thinking about it. But, you know, there's such a, a collection of rich stories and themes and patterns. And I thought, okay, I think, I, yeah, I think this will be my next book. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> having written many books before, you know, that it's no small undertaking. So but the seed, the seed was planted yeah. and has uh, blossomed. Well, and opportunities to make new mistakes. And you you were being kind about saying I had helped and mentored you. And I'm kind of thinking back, like, I'm glad I was able to, because sometimes I, mean, I feel like I don't have this all figured out hardly at all. But Well, no, I mean, none of us have it all figured out. And I think that <laughs> is the beauty of being able to share, having a forum to be able to share mistakes so that we can pass on knowledge that we've learned so that other people don't have to make the same mistake yeah. again they'll make different mistakes and sometimes we all have to make you know go through our own process but there are some avoidable um, yeah. you know mistakes that don't need to be made again by multiple people well yeah and if I can share a quick example I mean you know Kinexus a uh, company I've been involved with for um, 12 years now this month um, has a culture we, we've always aimed for a culture of continuous improvement but that started occurring to me there is a culture of learning from mistakes within Kinexus. So there, there end up being quite a few stories in the book um, about Kinexus and how that starts with the CEO kind of modeling mm. that practice of admitting and sharing mistakes. But uh, it's not at all uncommon, in, you know, the weekly all hands meeting on Friday for someone to admit a mistake and to share it in the spirit of, hey, I want to let other people know, right? It's not for them to shame themselves or to be ridiculed. It's really in the spirit of sharing and learning. And it's such a, a kind, helpful act yeah. to share that mistake. Because you're right, there are some of them where once one person's made it, the rest of us can learn and then hopefully avoid the mistake. Right. I mean, that's how, you know, I talk about that chain of learning in our organizations and that's part of it. It's giving yeah. people the space to make their own mistakes or have it be okay to, that we are, you know, to air as human. But we don't need right. to create a place where it's always a gotcha, you know, that like, yeah. oh, we'll let you like stumble through that, you know, that bad process out there. So how do you know, how do we fix that? Yeah. You know, when you mentioned the podcast episode that Mr. Yoshino, the subject of my book, uh, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, um, is about so 40 year Toyota leader. And 
the story I tell the most is the one that he told about his favorite mistake mm -hmm. on the podcast. And I know the reason it resonates with so many people is because it, it taught, it really highlights how Toyota embraced this, uh, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. And in fact, it's our responsibility as leaders to set up conditions for people to not make mistakes and then welcome them as an opportunity mm -hmm. right. when they do. Uh, and so it was really great to hear Mr. Yoshino tell that story in his own voice to other, to other people. Uh, but it also sets up the contrast to me of how much a lot of our own, the business cultures that we work in are not spaces mm -hmm. right. um, where that's okay. That would be the first reaction um, to people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a healthcare story in the, in the book that's more the cautionary tale. Um, uh, an anesthesiologist, uh, Dr. David Mayer, told a story that might have been 30 years ago when he was uh, a resident. And, um, you know, uh, yeah. sur there, there was a wrong site surgery. And um, the, the attending surgeon, it was actually the resident surgeon who made the incision on the wrong side, but the attending wasn't in the room. And like, it's all screams systemic error and miscommunication and what have you. But um, the attending surgeon lied to the patient, which that's more of a choice. Like the, 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 the slip of, of um, mm. the preventable error of making the incision on the wrong side is one thing. Lying to the patient is a different type yeah. the cover up. of mistake. And, and, and the, and the thing that made it a favorite, uh, for, for Dr. Mayer was that it really opened his eyes and inspired what's now been, you know, a careers long passion for patient safety advocacy mm. and culture improvement and, and trying to create a culture where it would be safe, um, as uncomfortable as it might be to acknowledge and to admit the mistake. And then better yet, like, you know, work toward mistake proofing. And as you, as you said, well, Katie, it's two sides of the coin. Like there, there are some mistakes that are relatively insignificant. Like not all mistakes are created equally, but a mistake that might harm a patient, that's something we should absolutely be doing our, our best to mistake proof. And that comes down to systems and communication and culture and then, like you said, when it happens, like in, in, in that situation there, um, there, there, there wasn't really going to be that, that culture of learning that would then maybe prevent the next wrong site incision. Yeah. You know, I, I remember you, I've had the pleasure of reading several chapters um, as a preview, and that, that story really resonated with me from my own experience as a patient. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't talked about this much, but, you know, I, 10 years ago, I had foot surgery and I have resulting nerve damage as that, you know, as a result of that surgery. And what was the most upsetting to me, you know, you can't do anything about, I have, you know, my, I have challenges for my foot for the rest of my life, but I didn't see the culture of learning and no mm -hmm. one came forward to me to say, everyone said, oh, that wasn't, it must have not have been me. Like the surgery went okay. And, you know, all these other things that I wanted to see, because I was working in hospitals and healthcare systems at the time in continuous improvement. If someone had just said, we know something went wrong, we don't know what it is, but we are investigating to make sure this mm -hmm. doesn't happen. We don't do the same thing. You know, I wasn't going to sue them, but I didn't yeah. see any of that. And to me, actually, that was the most upsetting part for me is I didn't see a culture of learning mm -hmm. so that my, you know, my bad outcome was not necessarily the trigger for them to do something right. different in the future. I know. Um, and I, 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 I had a relative recently who it was a near miss. It was a near miss that was caught, but an anesthesiologist barged into this family member's uh, room before surgery and started talking about the need to do intubation a certain way because it was difficult the last time. And like, wait a minute, what do you mean last time? There had not been a, a surgery you know, for decades. And clearly the anesthesiologist had just come into the wrong room and I would guarantee you that was the end. Like once that was caught, end of story, go find the right room where I followed up with, with Dr. Mayer and like, what would happen in your organization? And he said, probably accurately, not just optimistically. He's like, oh, we would root cause that hmm. yeah. because whatever the cause of the anesthesiologist going into the wrong room was, if you don't solve the problem or, or at least drive some improvement and prevention, What's to say it's really going to get caught the next time? That's the risk when we're not learning from even a near miss. Yeah. 
No, ab absolutely. Um, you know, I've been reflecting on how the vulnerability that it takes to talk about mistakes mm -hmm. and was thinking about my own experience of being on the podcast the first time where I really was thinking more retrospectively of my favorite mistake. Mm -hmm. And then within the next year, I actually had a real time new favorite mistake. And I remember contacting you and you talked about it with the recording of my audio book. Yeah. And I said in the future, like I need a few months to process this, but I want to come mm -hmm. on and, and use that yeah. space for reflection. But how sometimes like, oh, we have, you know, mistakes are painful for for mm -hmm. us. And even if we're acknowledging it in the moment to, to be able to talk about it takes some time in uh, the reflection. Yeah. I really appreciate all of the guests on your show who and who've contributed to the book too, to be willing to share mistakes and having that vulnerability because it's with by being vulnerable to each other, we actually create that culture where it's okay to mm -hmm. share yeah. uh, as well. Well, and, 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 you know, that word vulnerability is, is interesting. Like, you know, I've, I've had an opportunity in the last year to learn a lot, um, you know, to have a chance to take a class um, and get some formal training and certification in psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of those teachers, um, uh, Tim Clark, um, who's been a guest on the podcast upcoming uh, episode, um, you know, uses the word vulnerability, and it, it's it's more about the situation. If speaking up to share a mistake brings the risk of punishment, admitting that mistake is vulnerable. It's a vulnerable act. It it creates the risk of harm. And you know, I think one of the things that's important, or it's I I've, I've better understood, and I I hope others you know could learn too. We instead of telling people to be vulnerable leaders can reduce the level of vulnerability, right? Reducing the risk, reducing the danger to make it safer to admit a mistake. You know, that that to me, I think is a really important practice. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things Mr. Yoshino has always talked about too, is leaders need to model the way. And I, I right. talk about this in my the leadership work that I do too. So how can we go first and share some of those mistakes and make that space where it's okay? And so your podcast and now the book really gives that space to be able to have people reflect on mistakes and now for to you know have an opportunity to talk about the power of learning from mistakes yeah um so i have a i have a few other questions about the book and mistakes in in general um i'm you know we've talked about a few a few key themes here about vulnerability about um, creating an environment where it's okay to um, even speak up and, and share mistakes what are like one or two other key themes that emerged um, as you, you know, synthesized all of your, mm -hmm. your input and created the book? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting patterns. You know, one is, and it is, as you brought up, usually the power of hindsight or, or, or time that's passed since a mistake, uh, is, it does heal the wound a little bit. Like, so when people talk about a favorite mistake, it may or may not be their quote unquote biggest mistake. Like I'm not asking people, what's your worst mistake or what's your biggest mistake? A favorite mistake is usually one that was big enough that it sticks with you and, and hopefully leads to some sort of growth mm. and learning. And, and, and so, you know, uh, there, there, there is that sting. And, and I, and I think, you know, usually people on the show are talking about mistake that happened years ago uh, or even decades ago, which, which I think speaks to the power of how a mistake can stick with us, you know, instead of being in denial or blaming others for our circumstances, you know, I admire people have come on the show and, you know, even if other people played a role, like, you know, when people take ownership of their decision, cause that's really, that's all we can do, you know, and, and to reflect on that instead of blaming others, I think sets a really um, good example. And, and then, you know, and this is something I've tried, um, I'm still working on is, um, you know, being kind to yourself first off, and then trying to be kind to others when they make mistakes. Um, you know, a, 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 not a majority, but a lot of guests use language. Um, they'll, they'll talk about how, oh, well, that was a stupid mistake, or that was a dumb mistake. And like, I try to catch that. And, and, and I would try to like, not scold people, but one point I try to make in the book around kindness is, um, you know, I don't think that's a helpful thing to tell ourselves or to tell others because smart people make mistakes. 
Um, you know, people will say sometimes like, well, it was a dumb mistake. It was, it was an unintended mistake. I'm like, well, all mistakes, I mean, by definition, like it, it's redundant to say it was an unintended mistake. You know, I think, you know, a mistake is a, a decision or an action. It's something in the moment we thought was a good idea. And then seconds or hours or days or months or longer later, we evaluate, like I think in like sort of Toyota type language, the gap between our expected outcome and the actual outcome, like there could be a gap. It's not necessarily a failure, mm. but we, we we step back and say, well, hmm, it's, it's more like a PDSA cycle. You know, we, we didn't get the outcome we expected. Um, why was that? What would we do differently in the future? Like that, that's where the learning comes from, where if we're just making ourselves feel bad, but saying, oh, it was dumb. It was stupid. It was, uh, I mean, I, 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 I try to um, not do that to myself as much. And I think when we think about a workplace culture, you know, to not do that to others, to be kind when they make a mistake, because they're going to feel, they, chances are they feel bad. They already feel bad. So why, why make them feel worse? I think that can get in the way of learning and improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Like how do we, we pass so much judgment yeah. And so it starts with ourselves and, and, you know, we have a human response when things go wrong or mistakes, but how do we hold that back and then behave in the way that we want? Uh, yeah. Or, or can we move past it? Yeah. Yes. Right? Acknowledge had, it yes. And then not create that blame and look at the process. Yeah. You know, I think this is the beauty of Mr. Oh. Yoshino's story with the paint. Like they didn't blame him for making the mistake. They might've had that initial reaction, but then he said, well, what was the process and how can we do that differently? And I think that's really, you know, the point, it, it goes back to my medical air. It's like the outcome is still there, but what was the process and could we have changed anything for the future Right. Uh, as well? But, but one, one other thing I've learned though, um, is leaving some space. Like there's a, there's this balance where like, I think we've all been taught problem solving and like, you want to do the problem solving when it's, when it's fresh. When you know as, as as soon as you can, while people you know you're still at the Gemba, people's memories aren't fading. That said, I've I've learned through some experiences that sometimes you do need to give someone a little space when when they feel bad to let them like process that or even like there's this balance maybe of like not waiting a really long time, but sometimes you need to ask, before we start asking five whys, yeah. you almost need to ask, how are you doing? Yeah, like are you feeling? the human. <laughs> the human. Yeah, and I think being able to get into problem solving mode can help us move past it, mm -hmm. but probably not while someone's still in that, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like just highly activated, I'm, you know, I'm upset mode. Cause you, you can't do, you know, good higher level thinking and problem solving when, when you're in that state. No. Yeah. So how do we lead first to that kindness, kindness to ourselves or kindness to others? And then the curiosity of how can we learn yeah. from this and improve it? Uh, you know, I was reflecting as you made the comments about how, you know, sometimes your favorite mistake may not be your, your biggest mistake. And it, I, when you invited Mr. Yoshino and me to the show the first time, I actually went like, it took a while for me to come up with what was going to be the yeah. mistake that I chose. And mine ended up being like a series of micro mistakes that I was making mm -hmm. over the course of, you know, my career where right? until when I had this big aha in yeah, contrast yeah. to then I had like truly a big mistake happen that in the moment, as it was going down, I'm like, this is a big mistake. And I can't wait to talk with Mark about it after I get through some processing and right. some internal kindness to myself about it. But so we can have these different levels of mistake, but the it's about, Learn, how do you learn from it? And, um, and how do you be kind to yourself? You know, I'm always thinking my, you know, my favorite Daruma dolls here, the Japanese figures that represent the saying fall down seven times, get up eight. I mean, that's the epitome of the mistake. Oh, you have real Daruma. I've got, I've got one here. Yeah. You gave it to me. Yes. Well, spreading Daruma love around the world, but how do we, how do we acknowledge that that like setbacks, the challenges and mistakes are inherent to us as humans. And it's about how do we get up and learn from it and continue, mm. continue on forward. I, I think it's part of the, the Toyota notion of respect for humanity or respect mm. for people. Yes. And that obligation of realizing we're human, we are going to make mistakes and for mm. lots of reasons, um, which is our infallibility, it's made worse by let's say fatigue or distraction or, or other issues. Yeah. 
Um, sometimes I, I, I hear in healthcare, people are realizing that being punitive is really counterproductive or unfair or unjust. Um, at, at, at the same time, we, we, we can't just throw our, I've, I've heard people throw their hands up and it's like, well, this went, uh, this went wrong. There was a mistake. We're not going to be punitive. We recognize it's human error. And then I think this is a mistake. People say, well, it, what can we do? They throw their hands up and say, it's human error. Human. What, can we, what can we do? And I'm like, that's exactly the question. Like to answer, what can we do to improve systems and processes and communication or training or other things where, you know, I think of uh, an expression uh, I attribute to Daryl Wilburn, who worked at Toyota a long time, that it's the leader's obligation to create a system in which people can be successful. Like that obligation Mm. is there of not just being nice every time a mistake is made. We don't want to be nice repeatedly. Like this is where Karen Ross helped me understand the difference between nice and kind. Nice is about, I don't want them to feel bad. Where kind is more helpful in an action oriented way. We might have to challenge Mm -hmm. somebody. I think another key Toyota word, challenge them, but help them not be in the position to be involved in that same mistake again. Like, I think that's the, the the kindest thing we can do. Absolutely. I mean, so Daryl's uh, experience echoes Mr. Yoshino's too. You know, his managers not only said what, like, let's figure out how to fix this. They said, thank you. Thank you for making yeah. this mistake because it showed us that we didn't set up the conditions at work for you to be successful. It's so powerful. It's such a different mindset than, yeah. you know, most places. So it's aspirational yeah. and we can move our way towards there. And, and, and I'm not trying to say Ki- uh, Toyota's perfect. I'm, I'm, no. I'm not trying to say Kinexus is perfect, but there's a consistency. Like this is not coincidence. It sounds like consistent culture. So one of my later guests and, and his story is also in the book, David Meyer, almost identical circumstances. So Mr. Yoshino was in Japan, 1960s, in a paint shop. David Meyer was uh, in Kentucky, Kentucky. 1980s, bumper molding environment. And and the the root cause to the problem is basically like, oh, wrong chemical went into machine. That was the mistake. And that same reaction around not blaming, Mm -hmm. looking for the root causes of it, and then D- David's story had a wrinkle of like a problem solving mistake where it took too long to get to the root cause because it was kind of the, the the human cognitive tendency to sort of latch on to the first notion of a cause. And they were doing all kinds of troubleshooting countermeasures that weren't related to what was actually the root cause of a wrong chemical going into the machine. And like just that consistency is is really powerful. And I've heard other stories from some other former Toyota people of a similar thing. So, you know, ideally, I mean, we'd say, well, you know, Toyota probably um, prevented that particular wrong chemical into the paint sprayers uh, mistake, but the wrong chemical going into some sort of machine yeah. that hadn't been completely solved. But again, like they, they're, the focus was on learning instead of what healthcare people call naming, blaming, and shaming. Yeah. Yeah. We got it. And we can shift culture by shifting how each of us respond to mistakes, both mm-hmm. kindness to ourselves. And then when it happens to yeah. others. Yeah. So Mark, we've been talking about a lot of other people's favorite mistakes. So what's, <laughs> what's your yeah. favorite mistake uh, today, at least? Of all the mistakes I've made today, what's my? Oh, no, 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 no. Dog. I mean, like today. <laughs> if asking you today, yeah. it doesn't have to be right. the mistake you made today. But if you were going on your show today, sure. what would you choose as your favorite mistake? Well, so there, there's there's two different stories. I'll tell the quick versions because I think they illustrate different types of positive things that maybe come out of uh, a mistake. And, and neither was the biggest, but um, meaningful in different ways. Um, I, when, when I took a job at Dell Computer coming out of grad school in 1999, it took me about a year to think like, hmm, that was a mistake. I started thinking about other things I wanted to do. And I left within the second year and joined a startup company. So I'm going to say like, well, there were positives that came out of that job at Dell. I, I um, was able to do some interesting work and um have two patents because of that work and uh, met a lot of people, including my wife, Amy. So I can't regret 
no. that, that quote unquote career mistake, um, because it, it did lead to, you know, uh, at the time, a, a, a very, a, a, at the time, a surprise to this day, a positive outcome I would- 21 and a half years later. I don't want to mistake, make a mistake in how I say something. No, no. <laughs> so there's that. And then um, story, um, you know, the story from, let's say, practicing lean of like being early in some of my manufacturing work and not fully engaging people mm-hmm. in improvement of like being the person doing, coming up with a solution and implementing it and then trying to get people to adopt it. I'm like, yeah. nope. Yep. That engagement was happening way too late. Now, like I, the one story that I tell, like when I was at Honeywell and going through basically a lean black belt certification, um, the culture there was not one that really engaged frontline workers in improvement. They didn't really create the time for people to be involved in improvement. So there were some systemic factors, but that said, um, I can own my own actions. And in hindsight, I could have done more to engage the frontline workers. And it would have been much more likely that the little um, visual uh, production Kanban system with the changeover triggers and all everything, you know, that it would have been really embraced and would have been sustained. Mm -hmm. So I think from that, from a career mistake perspective, you know, that inspired me to say, well, okay, I don't want to make that mistake again. And I don't want to be in a position where I'm not allowed to engage the frontline people doing the work. So those were a couple of my key takeaways from that favorite mistake. Yeah, I, I had similar, you know, my my favorite mistake that I shared on the first episode when Mr. Yoshino was on too, is similar, like coming in with all the answers and being the one, like being the expert problem solver and so excited, which is great, but how do we, it's not necessarily having the right impact. So how do we leverage those things that are like positive, like my positive energy and my desire to solve problems, but but do that in a different way? Yeah. Uh, so if we go to the process of writing your book. What's um, what's one mistake you've learned from uh, for this book that you're willing to share? The process of writing. Yeah. Well, there's the process of writing, and there's the process of publishing. Okay. Uh, one of the, either of the. Two. Well, and there, there's there's a lot there's a lot of mistakes. Um, one was going in and setting up um, the Kindle version pre order in Amazon. Um, setting the publication date. I set that for June 27th, thinking that there would be plenty of uh, like three weeks buffer time. Uh, I, w- I wanted the, the the print book and the Kindle book to ideally launch um, at about the same day. Uh, I, I, I see Amazon allows you to pull the date forward. They really don't want you to be late and to push it back. Mm-hmm. Um, so the mistake, and there've been some little hiccups and and production delays with the print book. My mistake was not setting more buffer time Mm. on the release date for the Kindle version. So now like no matter what, even if the print book's not ready for another week, pretty much have to release the Kindle book on June 27th. Um, it's not a huge problem, but like in hindsight, it's a mistake. I should have set the release date for like the end of August, knowing that Again, it was easier. I knew the ground rules, right? So it's one of those decisions where, like this comes back to the pattern of like, why do we make mistakes? I made an assumption that turned out not to be correct about when uh, the print book would be ready. And, um, you know, so look, I that that mistake's on me. And I, I, the, I, if I do another book in, you know, another four or five years or something, um, I'd like to think I won't repeat that mistake. Yeah. Well, note for everyone else who's listening, who's uh, going to publish a book or thinking about it, just uh, note that one away for yourself and the whole yep. uh, the whole platform. I mean, I think all of us could come together and share <laughs> so many yeah. and publishing mistakes. So, but the exciting news is, so everyone, you can get the Kindle uh, version for Mike uh, Mark's book, uh, The Mistakes That Make Us, um, June 27th, 2023. And the paperback will be out very shortly uh, thereafter. It's almost there. As we record this on June 13th, it's going through the final proofreading. Then it goes through uh, a quote unquote final revision. And, you know, the the beauty of being the publisher and being in a print on demand world, um, no book has, I don't think has ever been published without a single typo. No. 
and it's easier to uh, go fix that file, uh, upload it to, to Amazon and the other printer um, that I use. And uh, yeah, I mean, and I can kind of laugh it off like yeah, it was a test yep. for you, the reader. <laughs> well, totally. I was appalled. You know, it, Karen Martin reassured me that, you know, even with traditional yeah. publishers, always typos yes. and mistakes. But yeah, so I was like, you know, but you just go and correct it. And that's that's the beauty. So uh, my, my, my first book, don't we talk about different mistakes? My first book, Lean Hospitals, through a publisher, had a typo on page one. Jeffrey Liker, one of his, I think it was actually the Toyota Way, major publisher, that had a typo on page one. So when you talk about systems, here's the thing I learned, that the, the, the page layout and publishing software they use, they said, does not have spell check in it. Mm, that's true. So you, you'd be using uh, Word or Google Docs, and you have all the spell check in the world, and then you flow the file into the design software. And if like the cursor is somewhere and somebody hits a key, you either accidentally delete a letter or inject um, another letter. And I'm, I, I don't know how and why there's no- It has to be better. <laughs> there's an opportunity for improvement and, yeah. and it creates opportunities for me to practice what I'm preaching um, about being kind, not just to myself, but to others. I'm, yeah. I, I'm not perfect, but I'm working on it. Yeah, well- aren't we all? So fall down, hopefully. Seven <laughs> get up. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we're, we're working yeah, that's on what, it. That, that's the, the key takeaway. How do you learn <laughs> from your mistakes? Because you're going to make them. So, um, well, thank you so much, Mark, for being on my show this time. You've been such a generous host for me, and I am thrilled yeah. to be um, celebrating you and the release of your book. And uh, how can people find out, in addition to Amazon, how to get the book, how to get in touch yeah. with you? Yeah. Well, I was going to say first one comes to celebrating and back to the Daruma. So this this is a Daruma for this book. I filled in its left eye. And when books are in hand, I will fill in the other eye. So this is now the last two books with a Daruma, thanks to Katie. So um, people can um, go to mistakesbook.com. So it's mistakes plural, mistakesbook.com. They can uh, download a free PDF preview of what the print book will uh, look like. And um, they, if they do that, or if they sign up for updates and notifications, um, they'll get an email letting them know uh, when the print book uh, is, is gonna be available through Amazon. So Amazon will be the main retailer, um, especially right away. And it could be available. Generally it takes longer, but it'd be available. If people wanna order it um, someplace else, they could order it directly through me at mistakesbook.com or eventually those other retailers. Awesome. Well, I am excited to read the whole book uh, and to continue to learn uh, from mistakes. So thank you, Mark. And everyone go out and either order or pre-order your copy of the book. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say, if I add one other thing, um, I, I am going to do an audiobook version that probably won't be available until the fall. And uh, I'm going to learn from the audiobook mistakes yeah. you shared in your second episode, Katie. Yes. Yeah, so many things to learn from, and I'm happy I can pay forward uh, the learnings. This is why we all collaborate. Yeah. Thanks everyone for watching, listening, or reading about uh, Mark's book, The Mistakes That Make Us. I'm again, I'm Katie Anderson. You can follow me at kbjanderson.com. That's my handle on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. And for those of you listening at the time of this release, Mark has a special um, surprise or opportunity for those of you who are living in the United States. Mark's giving away... Yes. Um, three copies of his book as soon as it comes out. Yes. And, and I apologize, um, limiting the giveaway to U.S. mailing addresses, but international, uh, international postage costs are yeah. um, really high, even for sending a, a relatively light book. So no, it's, for it's that. okay. everyone can get the, get your ebook uh, copy as well. So thank you, Mark. And uh, so Go ahead and enter if you're in the U.S. to win a copy of Mark's book. And for the everyone oh, else- And it'll be a signed copy. Oh, there you go. So a signed copy and then order a copy for to give to one of your friends as well. So, oh, Mark, let's see your um, your mug there too. It looked like a- Oh, it's a, a coffee mug with the- yeah, uh, The mistakes that make us. Book cover yeah. as well. Oh, I don't have- And the big book. giant book cover behind me if anyone missed it. Yeah, and the other, and the other uh, books as well. So- Thanks, Mark. I'm so excited for you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Have a great day. Thanks, Katie. Bye, Mark.